Welcome to the Humans and Events Cycling Podcast. I'm Richard Moore. I'm with Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. Daniel Freib. Evening, Richard. And Jonathan Vauters. Evening. Jonathan was so angry at last week's podcast, having listened to it at home in, in Denver, that he caught a flight as soon as he could over to the UK to re- reproach us to our faces, and, and we're, we're here with him tonight. But where are we, Lionel? Uh, we're in Vino Teca in Turnham Green in uh, sort of West London, not far from uh, where you live, Richard. Very nice neck of the woods. Funny that, isn't it? Yeah. It's a very lively wine bar. Jonathan bought it in a, in a, a wine obsessive, I would say. Um, but I don't think he flew over specifically to participate in the podcast. I think he was here on official business. Anyway. I don't think so, Lionel. No? I have information that says otherwise. Excellent. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. Interviews and analysis. We've got the big talking points covered. Jonathan, we were quite critical of Ryder Hesedal, Garmin Sharp, and yourself, I suppose, on our podcast. We were certainly asking some questions of, you know, how, how the disclosure was made that he had doped a few years ago. I mean, do you regret the way that was handled? Do you regret the way that it came out? I mean, I don't... I don't of course, it would have been much simpler if he had uh, publicly confessed along with the rest of our riders that we had in that situation last fall. And we would have preferred that. However, the fact of the matter was, at that point in time, he had not even been asked or questioned or considered by USADA to be a person of interest, which surprised me at that time. But eventually, you know, they did get around saying, and you have to remember that they can only deal with so many things at a time. And that, you know, even if people are calling them up saying, hey, you know, you forgot about this guy, or even if I'm calling them up saying, hey, you forgot about this guy, that they can only get to this so quickly. Eventually, they did get around to saying, okay, we do need to talk to Ryder uh, to see if he ha- has anything to add to this. So he did, and he went in. But by that point in time, we're sort of in this awkward, okay, now what? Because, you know, we got a letter back from USADA saying, thank you very much, cooperation, so on and so forth, and that's it. Is there a suspension? No, no suspension. All right. So what do we, what do we, you know, what do, we do? We're sort of in, in this strange space of, of, okay, what now? So we asked them, is this, you know, is this, a, is this a public matter? Is this not a public matter? No, as with all witnesses in ongoing cases. Now, the ongoing case with, in Ryder's case has nothing to do with Garmin. It's got nothing to do with the team. It's got nothing to do with Ryder. It's got nothing to do with his past. It's an you know, ongoing investigation into Rasmus and Rabobank, CSC, the tangents thereof, the people who were involved in those teams, so on and so forth. That's the you know the broader investigation. Is, into is, that, is that an investigation that's being conducted by USADA at the moment? Correct. I mean, they're basically saying we're conducting a broad-scale investigation into the sport of cycling. And so he was asked to not comment, and we were asked to not comment, so okay, not comment. And then at that point in time, you're basically put in sort of a stasis uh, where, I mean, we were fully aware that, well, eventually this is going to come out, one way or the other, so, you know, it's going to come out, but what do we do in the interim? Well, there's really not much to do except wait. So actually, when the when the Rasmus and excerpt came out, we were caught by surprise a little bit. We instantly wanted to know, okay, you saw it as CCES, are we allowed to comment on this? And that's actually what the reason that our statement took so long coming out is because we're calling them saying, hey, you know, what do we do? And and they were unaware that it had even broken initially, and so then they had to go in and then talk to their counsel and this and that and the other. So eventually we got the green light, and I actually put that out on Twitter, waiting for a couple of approvals. Eventually got the green light to make a statement. Well, to be honest, the statement was a little bit rushed. For me, it wasn't an ideal statement. It was 5 o'clock in the morning in Maui, because that's where he lives, so even getting in touch with him is very difficult. So, you know, did it, did it come out perfectly baked? No. Jonathan, as I understand it, you'd known for a number of years about this element of um, Ryder's past. One question that a lot of people have asked is why you didn't encourage Ryder to talk about it openly before. And generally, as a policy in your team, you are very transparent, but why you don't take that transparency further and disclose all the information you have about your staff's past? Because we've been told that it's essentially counterproductive to the investigations that USADA and WADA are conducting. But even, even before even these before, it investigations, be... even in 2007 and 2008? Even before at that point in time, 2007, yeah, I mean, even at that point in time, they 
make it and have made it consistently very clear with me that they would prefer that you speak with them. And so I've always made it and very consistently clear with them that you let me know what you need. We're here. You know, sometimes they, they want to know something. And this applies to everyone, just to be clear. This isn't just the riders. This is, you know, the mechanics, one yours, whatever. That we're going to be open about this process. And so whenever they call me up and say, hey, we'd like to take this person, okay, fair enough. Then there you go. And whether or not that becomes a matter of public record or not, and I understand that people are upset that, that it isn't always a matter of public record, but you have to remember the core motivation, the core objective for creating that policy is not to, you know, satiate the desires of fans, the media, so on and so forth. The, 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 the reason for that transparency with officials, the end objective, is fair sport. So, if I'm looking at, well, how do I create a pathway to fair sport? It's my belief that, you know, you have to have that information compiled by somebody who can do something with it and who can move a process forward. And, you know, to me, the objective sources of that for the past, you know, decade have been WADA and USADA. And so, okay, get it in their hands and then allow them, give them as much ammunition as you possibly can to allow the process to work and to get to fair sport. I mean, it's the whole, it's the whole policy of the whole team is, is that if you just fire or push somebody out or reject them or leave them to the side of the road because something like this comes out or that they are truthful and you say, oh, I don't want to deal with this or that you that you put in place a, a zero tolerance policy that, that, that makes people fear the truth, then you've set back the process to get to fair competition a considerable amount. Now, is it a little bit uncomfortable or a lot uncomfortable that you've got guys that people say, well, why wouldn't you forward about this earlier or you know, we don't really like the fact that you've got this ex-doper on your team and so on and so forth. Yes, that's extremely uncomfortable. Um, I don't like it. I'm sure our sponsors, such as Sharp, don't really particularly like it. But that's a decision that I've made due to the end objective. It would have been much easier for me to, years ago, because you got to remember when, when this whole sort of blow up had happened, it was in 2010. All of these guys could have been released from their contracts in that period of time. I could have just said, ooh, let's just quietly push them off, you know, not even fire, just not renew them to their contract. Let's just let them go quietly, right? And that would have been a very easy path to take. And when this came out, this wouldn't have been my problem. This would have been, I don't know, some other team's problem because they would have hired the Giro d'Italia winner, right? But we never did that because I realized that that that's actually destructive to the ultimate goal of getting to clean racing. So do I have to take a gut check for that? Do I have to piss off a lot of people to do that? Yeah, I do, but I, 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 don't, I don't see a better way to get to the end objective. This is the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast with Richard Moore, Lionel Burney, and Daniel Free. You are listening to a Humans Invent Cycling Podcast special as we speak to Jonathan Vauters, Chief Executive Garmin Sharp, answering our questions about Ryder Hegedal and anti-doping. Jonathan will still find it hard to comprehend why Ryder couldn't come out publicly and say, I dope, look, there's an investigation going on, I can't comment any further on who else was involved, the buck stops. No, I, I, you know what, I, I, I mean, I agree with you. That's not the request that we got from from USADA and, and CCES. Are you tempted to just go over their head and do it anyway yes. in future? absolutely. Yes, to be honest with you. Yes. Sorry, just winding back to the 2012 Giro, which Ryder was winning and then, then won. With this knowledge in, that you had, did you feel uncomfortable about any aspects of the race, knowing that this information might come out at some point? And perhaps, not, not that I'm suggesting that he didn't win that race clean and hadn't been clean for a number of years, but still the perception is that he won that race as a clean rider historically, not as an ex-doper. He wasn't, you know, David Miller won two stages in the next that's, thing is that that's, that's nothing that I've ever said. That's nothing that he's ever said. You know, I, you I let mean, people say that, no? In a sense. That's fair. That's fair to say that I, that, well, you're right. I never actively corrected them because if I actively corrected them, then that's effectively, then I just, you know, basically let the whole thing go right then and there. Again, that's a, that's a, that's a hard line to walk because you've been requested to not disclose the information. However, you know it's there, 
and then someone says, well, isn't that great, a clean rider won the Giro d'Italia? Well, the answer to that is yes, a clean rider did win the Giro d'Italia. It was a rider that was always clean. Well, specifically, no one's ever asked me that, so... I, I mean, I fully understand the, the implications of that, but you have to remember, going back to my thing, end objective to try to get to fair racing, there are some hard decisions that have to be made in order to get to that point, and I think some of that is also respecting what USADA and WADA want, and also respecting a rider that, that has chosen to be honest and, and, and not unintentionally outing them, you know, randomly in an interview. Well, what do you say, Jonathan, to the perception that there is a closeness between yourself and, and Garmin Sharp and USADA? You know, how comfortable would you feel if another team owner had that sort of relationship with USADA that you have? Listen, end of the day, I think USADA has been the first anti-doping body willing to actually dig into the difficult issues in the sport. I've never seen another anti-doping body that's willing to actively investigate things. Instead, they basically sit there and shuffle through the paperwork, positive, negative, positive, negative, okay, this guy gets a suspension, this guy doesn't. You saw it as the first anti-doping body that's actively investigating this stuff. So, are Travis Tigard and, and myself, do we get along on the basis that our philosophies are sim similar? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm proud of that fact, quite frankly. Lance Armstrong has been in the, in the news again this week. Um, do, you, do you think Armstrong has been treated fairly? I don't have all the information to really know that, and there's obviously conflicting stories on that. I was always informed that if he decided to cooperate, that he was going to be treated very much equally to, to all the other witnesses in that case. I certainly hope that that was the case. Now, honestly, everything I've seen that's been publicly released, again, I have the same limitation as you guys on this, I don't have any inside information, but everything that I've seen that was publicly released has said that he was given the same opportunity as the other riders. Have you had any contact with Armstrong recently? Not recently, no. Just on the issue of confessions, Jonathan, you, there, there is a feeling that you, you know, there are a number of riders who have confessed in your team that, that it's almost becoming too easy, um, perhaps the sport doesn't need any more repented dopers, and that perhaps you know that we're desensitised to it, we've almost been brutalised, and that they're not even that remorseful anymore because it's taken as read that everyone did it in that period. Would, would you agree with that or do you see in the guys that you've worked with a genuine remorse and a genuine contrition and a genuine kind of soul searching? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely see that, but that just isn't necessarily revealed to the public. Um, you know, I see a guy like Dave Zabriskie who um, you know, I think that he's still very much tortured by that whole decision has passed and, and you know, has decided to step away from the sport because um, because of that remorse. The guys aren't less remorseful, and the apologies aren't necessarily any different. What's different now is that people are becoming a little bit immune to it, and they're just looking at it going, well, this looks sort of the same as the last apology, and they're dismissing it. But they're not, they're not having to interact with the rider. They're not having to call the rider and, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning get a phone call from a rider who's crying about, you know, and apologizing and so on and so forth. They, I mean, they aren't interacting with these people on a personal level. And I don't, I don't know how to bring those tearful 3 o'clock in the morning phone calls, those... Um, you know, the real feelings of these guys public, I really don't. I, 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 I mean, I wish I could, but, you know, my interactions with them, um, you know, very much tells me that, that this is not an easy issue for them to deal with at all. I mean, there's obviously a spectrum, a continuum. Are they all incredibly contrite, or have you seen guys who are torn apart by it and guys who you know, are fairly blasé about the whole thing? People express emotions in different ways, you know. That, that's, it's, hard to, it's hard to really tell. You know, some people hide things better than others. How about Ryder? Because we haven't really heard from him since these revelations. He, he released a statement, but... But he's, he's still been asked not to comment. Yeah. You know, USADA CCS said, okay, fair enough, if you'd like to do this, but we, we, we prefer that there be no further comments on this from him. So, I'm sure you guys will get 
quite a few comments from him when you know we get the green light on it. And believe me, we've been pushing very hard because Ryder wants to. He wants to put his side of the story out there. He wants to. He wants to talk about it. There's no hiding on his part. It's more of a well. He, Procedural. Yeah, issue. it's more of a procedural issue. Yeah. I mean, again, you know, listen. I, I mean, we're in America. Or I'm in America. He's a Canadian. Both aware of, you know, in America, First Amendment rights. He can say whatever he wants. He can come out anytime he wants. I don't know all of the consequences of him getting into details publicly. It might be nothing, or it might be very significant to ongoing investigations. That's difficult to tell. I, I, I mean, I just I wish I knew the answer to that, but I, I don't. And so I feel like we need to respect the ongoing investigations. You're listening to the Humans Invent Cycling Podcast, powered by Sharp. You are listening to a Humans Invent Cycling Podcast special as we speak to Jonathan Vauters, Chief Executive of Garmin Sharp, answering our questions about Ryder Hegedal and anti-doping. One thing that kind of occurs to me is that this is being played out in two arenas really. There's the official arena with the anti-doping authorities and then there's the public arena. And I completely understand where you're coming from in dividing those two and having a very clear line and your policy of cooperating completely with the authorities is you know, beyond reproach. I mean, there's no criticism of that. But talking a little bit about the way cycling is progressing and then the need to kind of establish a more secure business model the the eyeballs of the people who are watching the races need to be kind of almost as important as the authorities who are keeping in check and it, i think the, the biggest the biggest conflict over the last week or so has been that 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 has been lost a little bit in the debate and that the you, you made a comment on twitter about how you cooperate with the authorities, not with the media or not with the fans. And I understand that, but it does come across a little bit as if the fans' point of view is being just pushed to the side. And if they switch off, and if they felt that they watched the 2012 Giro thinking it was one thing, and actually, you know, in reality, it was the same thing that was projected, but there was a very important detail that was missed out of their understanding of that race. And I just wondered, from your point of view, how sticking to your policy going forward that is sustainable if there was another situation of a similar set of circumstances i don't think it is sustainable you know we've lived through a really rough year a rough time what's sustainable long term is a, is a zero tolerance policy where none of the riders on your team have ever doped my personal thought is you do not get to that and you don't allow the entire sport to get to that unless you deal uncomfortably with the dichotomy of riders who have testified about their past to the authorities but have not done so publicly. And that's a hard line to ride, but you're right, it's, it's not sustainable. You can maintain the body blows and the punches to the face and whatever else for, for a while, but eventually people will tire of that, viewers will tire of that, sponsors will tire of that, and they'll want to be done with it. So zero tolerance is what you're working toward. I just don't think you get to zero tolerance by, by you know popping up and saying, okay, from today forward, that's it, because you haven't actually allowed the system to deal with the issue. I mean, that's the, it, the analogy is an alcoholic that just wakes up one day and says, I'm not drinking anymore. How often does that work? <laughs> Almost never. The smoker that wakes up one day and just says, I'm not going to smoke anymore. How often does that work? There actually has to be... Now, of course, I'm not talking about individuals here. I'm talking about a systemic, a systemic smoker, a systemic alcoholic. There actually has to be a rehabilitation process. That rehabilitation process requires quite a bit of pain. So, you know, it's not sustainable. What is sustainable is zero tolerance, but we're not there yet. And, 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 and I'm sorry for people who are focused on that. Like, we are not there yet. In... I firmly believe three, four years' time we will be to the point where we can do that if we continue to be open and honest and other people follow that model. That if, if, if that works and eventually the message goes, hey, you know, no matter who you are, you're going to get caught or somebody is going to say, hey, I saw that guy do this, that, that, that openness and honesty is, and transparency is going to feed through the entire sport and the realization will be, okay, even if the testing isn't perfect, one way or the other this comes out, so let's just cut it out permanently. But that message has to be reinforced and reinforced and reinforced and reinforced and that's what's happening right now. Someone, someone this week commented on the 
the irony in a way of, of a lot of criticism this year and, and last year being directed at Team Sky and Garmin Sharp, two teams who have kind of been at the forefront of, of anti-doping. How, how confident do you feel that the rest of the sport, the other teams, that we don't, we don't actually talk about a lot in this context, how yeah. confident do you feel that they are, they are also, that we can also believe in them? You know, listen, that's tough. I mean, and, and this week has really brought that to light. Uh, to me because I am disappointed in a lot of teams that the ongoing attitude is head down mouth shut but let's take it from their perspective for a minute if you back up and and you know they open the newspaper and it's in its team garment sharp getting kicked in the head again why on earth you want to go down that road that sounds stupid let's just be quiet let's be quiet about our guys that are involved in mentova or whatever it is let because it'll just go away and if something pops up we'll just quietly show them the door, and that'll be that. You can't be surprised though, Jonathan. I no, mean, they I, haven't I'm moved not. an inch for years. No, exactly. And so, listen, I mean, we're going about it the way we're doing it, and, and, and if we kill ourselves trying to do it single-handedly, well, that's unfortunate, but I'm halfway through the tunnel. Like, it, backing up isn't going to make sense at this point in time. You know, the only way is to sort of walk out the other end, and, and so... Will that be more painful than it would have been had we just done... I mean, just imagine mid-May 2010, if instead of coming into the bus and saying, Zabriskie, Tom, Christian at Tour California, listen, you guys, like, this is, this is what I want you to do. This is what our policy is going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to support you all the way. Imagine I came into the bus and said, all right, anyone involved in, like, you're out. With those guys, what are they going to do? I mean, I don't know. Like, my hope is that they go out and, and they and that they still do, the, you know, the same action. But I mean, imagine. Like, the message there is is okay. So, I mean, how how easy? I guess the greater point of it is is how easy would it have been to just say Floyd Landis is an alcoholic, a crazy man, blah blah blah. He has no um, credibility, so on and so forth. It's a very easy route. Probably would have gone away very quickly. Have you felt the last couple of weeks like backing up the tunnel? Because it has, as you say, been quite a rough couple of weeks for you. Of course, I, I feel like, well, why did we do this? Why, why did, why did we put ourselves through this pain? It, it, this is, this is ridiculous. Like we're taking the heat for hundreds and hundreds of people that are still involved in cycling, and we're basically being, you know, focused on. But when I stop. And, and I stop getting my feelings hurt and my ego getting bruised and so on and so forth. And I think about, okay, what was the original objective? What, you know, years ago when Doug Ellis and I decided this is the way we're going to create this team, what were our philosophies? What were the core tenets? And what we're doing fits into that. So, like, unless you're going to just diverge from, from those core philosophies, core objectives, core tenets, to say, well, we're just going to go away from all that to protect our image you basically got to take the hard questions, take the ego blows, take the take the heat and, and continue on the path that you originally set out on. Who are the key people in there with in the tunnel with you? Because you're not walking through it alone, I assume. But I mean, you've, you've got presumably backing from Doug and from sponsors and... Well, I will uh, obviously give a huge, huge amount of props to both Garmin and Sharp and Cervelo and that all of these sponsors have, they've agreed with this process, they understand the process, they understand it's not going to be easy, They and have supported us and have not backed away at any given moment. And that's something that allows us to continue along the path. If, again, there are, I mean, the same thing with riders, same thing with team management. If the sponsors had said, whoa, we don't want to be any part of this mess, let's get out of here. That takes away from that end objective of fair racing. It basically sends out the message: don't have your riders go forward, don't have your riders testify, don't have them be on it. You know, let's even back up to Ryder. Like Rasmussen said that he technically he said he's, he taught Ryder how to inject himself on an orange or something, right? How easy would it have been for Ryder to say, "Well, yeah, I mean, he showed me how to inject an orange, but I never did it to myself. In fact, I thought Rasmussen was crazy, and you know what? I'm going to go ahead and sue him." Again, that's an easy road. And your sponsor would probably think, oh, okay, well, great, uh, he's suing them. But it's dishonest to your sponsor, it's dishonest to your fans, it's dishonest to the sport, it's dishonest to the young athletes that are on the team. And so, again, we're lucky enough that we have sponsors that realize, you know, this is, this is 
a long and hard battle. And that if you want to get to that end objective of fair racing, it, it, it's, it, it doesn't just fall into your lap. It doesn't just, you know, we fire one or two people and then, okay, it's all done and it's fine and it's good. It's not realistic. So, Orange, I feel sorry for. Yeah. Jonathan, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for having me. The Humans Invent Cycling Podcast. For more articles, go to humansinvent.com slash cycling.